how's it going? Bring us the atmosphere from the floor. How does it feel to be back <laughs> in person? Well, Emily, thanks for having me. And, you know, we, we're, we're saying this week we're putting the live back in Cisco Live. We've got 16,000 <laughs> of our closest friends here. We have a lot of our partners back here that are demonstrating. There's lots of education going on. We had a slew of great product announcements this week. And so I think everybody is just, as you would expect, excited to be together in person. I think everybody's been longing for it, and we joked today that I, we're so glad that we're not doing this over video in a stale you know, uh, room somewhere where we're getting no feedback. So it's a lot of energy. Now, Cisco has always been considered a bellwether for the economy, and I have to wonder what your customers are telling you and how inflation and what's happening in the markets is impacting how they're spending. Well, you know, we talked today with our customers and partners here about the fact that over the last five or six years, We've dealt with a global trade war and tariffs. We've dealt with a pandemic. We've dealt with social justice issues. We've dealt with supply chain issues. We have a war in Ukraine. We have inflation. So our, our, our customers, while it's not the new normal, I think they're dealing with the reality that there is always something going on in the world. And technology has proven to be so effective during the pandemic at keeping the global economy and the global productivity uh, at a great level that I think technology is going to remain strategic for our customers, and most of them say they're, they're powering ahead. So we'll see. Elon Musk says he has a super bad feeling about the economy. Jamie Dimon said he's preparing for an economic hurricane. How does Chuck Robbins feel? Well, I, I remain optimistic, but I also understand there's a lot of complexity in the world. And uh, I think that, you know, we're focused on delivering the technology to our customers, to, focused on delivering for our shareholders. And we'll have to see how things play out. There's certainly a lot of complexities. I think the Fed's going to move tomorrow. The question is how far do they move and what does that mean? Uh, but uh, I think, you know, we're just preparing for what we can control and then we'll uh, respond accordingly to things that we can't. So are you preparing for a possible recession? I mean, you have to be planning for different scenarios. We are always planning for different scenarios, but we've been around long enough and been through enough downturns that... We, we have playbooks and we know how to we know how to deal with those appropriately. So we'll see. I, I'm trying not to borrow any trouble right now, even though I understand it's a very complex environment that we're operating in. So let's talk about the supply chain. What do you see that's still being impacted, especially when it comes to Cisco? What problems are starting to unwind and how long will these problems in general be with us? Yeah, I think on the supply chain front, Right now, we're obviously still seeing capacity issues around semiconductors because every product on the planet now seems to have one or more semiconductors in it. And that's probably in the 2023 time where we start to see some capacity come online. We've seen, obviously, the PC demand is kind of slowed, which we think has freed up some components uh, in the marketplace. And uh, we're starting to see inventories at brokers increase a bit, which they build their inventories from oversupply that, that suppliers have acquired that they don't need. So that's actually a positive sign. So we're starting to see some good signs, but I still think we're, we're three, six, nine months to where we really get this thing resolved in a way that's acceptable to our customers, honestly. We're now in a period where the big bit debate is, do you go back to work full time or not? WebEx, of course, one of Cisco's top products helps enable remote work. What is Cisco's policy at this point on remote work? How are you thinking about it and, and what it means to the company and your investors? So there's two things. Number one, we've opened our offices and we actually are leaving it with the, the management, the manager and their team to determine how many days a week do you need to be in the office as a team to drive your productivity? And then if you say that's two days, then which days do you want to come in as a team? We don't think in our case, we don't think it makes sense to mandate days where people are coming in the office. Before the pandemic, we had almost 15 percent of our employees work from home full time anyway. And a great majority of our teams have distributed team members. So they're going to be interacting over video uh, anyway. And so we're leaving it up to the teams. But we're also building a whole set of, of products and a, a solution portfolio for our customers who are trying to solve this hybrid work issue because every customer has a different approach that they're taking, and we believe we have a lot of technology that can help them. So do you think Elon Musk calling workers back to the office, is, is he going to be on the wrong side of history? Well, every company, I think, is different in what they need, and, and there are, like, groups within our company that have decided they need to be in the office more often. So our engineering teams 
that want to collaborate and whiteboard and build products together, they're spending more time in the office than perhaps some of our other teams. So it'd be very difficult for me to critique another CEO's decision about what they believe they need their employees to do. But for us, we think this strategy is working so far. And we've seen the innovation continue to, to pour out of the organization. The teams are doing a phenomenal job. So we're quite comfortable with where we are. If the future of work is hybrid, you know, security is even more important. And I know that's one of the, the focuses of Cisco Live. You know, talk to us about the, the threat landscape you see out there for businesses and the vulnerabilities they still face in terms of shoring up their defenses, getting their systems ready and able to enable this kind of work for the long-term future. Well, the complexity that's been created over the last few years, uh, every customer we have now is dealing with employees that are massively distributed. Their applications are running in multiple places, public clouds, private clouds, SaaS applications, as well as data is now being distributed. And now we have IoT really becoming real, so we're bringing new devices onto the network. And so it really creates a new paradigm around how our customers need to defend in security, which is why we announced our strategy around Cisco Security Cloud this week, continued trusted access, Secure Connect Plus. So we're bringing out technologies that help for this new environment. And at the same time, I think it's just imperative for all of us that we have to stay focused on employee hygiene because the people and the passwords and all those things that we, we count on everyone to do properly every day continues to be one of the biggest risks in the system. What's your view on M&A right now with valuations coming down? Are there any areas you're interested in, potential targets you could share? <laughs> well, we have, uh, I've, I've been asked a few times if our M&A strategy has changed because of the valuations, and I've said our strategy hasn't changed. The openness to talking to us might have changed on the other side, but uh, <laughs> you know, we remain interested in the same areas we have been interested. Uh, you know, we're always on the lookout for security. There are emerging areas around observability. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we start with, is it a strategic fit for uh, our technology portfolio? Is it a cultural fit? And is it good for our shareholders long term? And as long as those three work, the valuations certainly make a lot more uh, assets actually fit in that criteria, a lot more so than perhaps six months ago. Any chance Cisco would make a competing bid for VMware? Uh, I'm not going to comment on that, but I think we're we, 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 we are constantly looking at all of our potential targets out there. And, uh, you know, we've had, we build partnerships with companies, we acquire, and we do lots of our own uh, innovation and internal research and development. We're going to continue to focus on all of those. So, look, Chuck, you've been in this industry for a long time. You've been working at Cisco for a long time. One of our guests earlier in the show pointed to Cisco stock and what happened in the dot-com bust and, and how it's taken decades to get back to where it was. From a historical perspective, how do you see this downturn fitting into the you know, longer term picture? I, I'm just so curious how you're evaluating it. It's funny you say I've been <laughs> around for a long time. You actually were one of my first interviews when I became CEO. <laughs> uh, and um, I think, look, what's happened is there's now a, a, a higher value put on being profitable, clearly. There's, uh, there's, there are a lot of similarities in some of the companies that had great ideas, uh, about, you know, similarities with the dot-com bust. And I think I've heard people talk about it today and over the last few days, is that there were certainly quality companies that emerged. And I think what, what will be realized out of this is that what are the real valid business models that are going to emerge that have the ability to make money over the short term and over the long term. But it's clear right now the market is going to reward real companies to build real things and make real earnings. And our current quarter, the low end of our guide we gave at the uh, last earnings call is a record EPS year for Cisco. So we're, we're pretty happy with where we are. So look, you know, if, as, as you're mapping out your plans, what's your own, what's your sort of strategic advice to yourself in terms of how you get, how you get from, you know, this point to the end of the year, dealing with all of these unpredictable forces? Well, my advice is look back at what you've done over the last two and a half years because they've just been different crises and we're just dealing with yet another one now. And, you know, we focus a lot. It, it sounds cliched, but... We focus a ton on the stuff we really can't control, and I've been that way almost all my life. Uh, the things that I can't control, I monitor and we plan for, but we don't worry about them. And so we're going to continue to do what we can do, continue to execute and continue to deliver technology that we think our customers really need right now. 
as everybody's trying to modernize and really build their architectures for the new world, and candidly to deal with the next crisis and be ready because so many of our customers were not ready when we went into the pandemic.